Kellogg's Pep, the super delicious cereal present the adventures of Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Yes, it's Superman, the man of steel. And today, Robin, youthful assistant of the famous Batman, tells him why he so desperately needs his help. But before we join them for the exciting story, let's hear from Dan McCullough. Okay, Dan. Say, gang, the other day an army pilot I know was over at my house looking at some pep model planes I had. And you know, he made a very interesting remark. He said that these pep planes were some of the best models he'd ever seen for identification work. And uh, he thought that all of you ought to be able to learn a lot from them. And I'll bet you have, too, if you've been making that super delicious cereal, Kellogg's Pep, your own special breakfast. Because right inside every single pet package, there's a colored cardboard plane model all ready for you to put together. And you don't have to send in a single penny for it, not even a box top. What's more, there are 14 different models you can get all together. Four British, two Russian, and eight American. And on the back of each model, there's a list of valuable pointers on how to spot that particular plane, as well as a general description of it. So, gang, if you haven't yet started your collection of these nifty plane models, get busy right away. Be sure your mother gets you a package of those golden, delicious whole wheat flakes tomorrow. See which model plane you find inside. And remember the name, Pep, P-E-P. Pep is made by Kellogg's in Battle Creek. And now the adventures of Superman. Sensing a story in a mysterious note addressed to Superman, Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen rented a boat and rowed out on North Bay where they found an unconscious boy in a rowboat. On their way back to shore with the boy, they were run down by a large speedboat and were near drowning when Superman appeared and rescued them. At a doctor's house, the boy revived and identified himself as Dick Grayson. He said he had sent the note to Superman and was in great trouble, but refused to discuss the matter with anyone but the Man of Steel. Clark Kent took Dick to his apartment where he left for a moment and then reappeared as Superman. He told Dick... He had seen the cape beneath his coat and the red leather vest with the letter R on it and recognized him as Robin, companion of the famous Batman. The boy admitted his identity and pleaded for help. You've got to help me, Superman. You've got to. Of course I'll help you if I can. You're the only one who can. Well, this sounds serious. It is. It's the most serious thing that ever happened. That's a pretty strong statement, Robin. It's true. You see... Yes? Batman has disappeared. What? Yes. Batman has disappeared. Great, Scott. Where? When? I don't know where. He left me in our cottage at Queens Point. That's across the bay. Yes? He told me to wait for him there. He said he'd be back before evening. But he didn't come back. He didn't, eh? When was this? I mean, when did he leave? It was yesterday. Batman left right after lunch. He said he'd be back in a few hours. Did he say where he was going? No. All he said was that he was working on the biggest case of his life. And he was all set to finish it up that afternoon. Did he give you any hint as to what it was? I begged him to, but he wouldn't. He said it was too dangerous for even me to be mixed up in. He said that the fate of the whole world depended on it. Fate of the whole world? Yes. You've got to find him, Superman, because what I'm afraid of is that those men got him. What men? The men who came to our cottage last night to get me. Now, wait a minute. You better tell me about that. I was going to. When Batman hadn't returned by dinner time like he said he would, I began to get a little nervous. And when he wasn't home by 10 o'clock, and then by 11, I was really worried. I decided to wait another hour and then call the police and start looking for him. But then Alfred, he's our butler, came into the living room where I was watching the clock. I say, Master Dick, we seem to be getting company. You mean Batman's back, Alfred? Unfortunately, no. But I was just out in the garden, and I observed half a dozen men sneaking up from the beach. They seem to be surrounding the house. What? Quite. And the bounders have guns. We seem to be in a bit of a predicament. What? I switched off the light, went to the window, and looked out. Alfred was right. There were men surrounding the house. They'd spread out, crouched down low, and they were sneaking up behind bushes and trees. I could see the guns in their hands, and I didn't like it. I rang to the phone to call the police. Hello, operator! Hello! Hello, operator! Hello! Hello! Oh, the phone's dead, Alfred. Dead? My word, how could a telephone die? I mean, it's not working. It was all right earlier this evening. 
Those men must have cut the wires. The doorbell. Oh, what do we do now? There are too many for me to take on alone. I'll help. I know a trick or two. No, too many guns, Alfred. We've got to get out of here and fast. Come on, Alfred. It's my word, but where? The gun chap has the house surrounded. I'll show you. Come on. I took Alfred down to the basement into a trap door that opens when you press a hidden button behind the furnace. I got it open and pushed Alfred in, following him just as we heard the men force their way into the house. I closed the trap door behind me and let Alfred through the tunnel to the boathouse. There was another trap door there that you could push up from underneath. And I started to open it when I heard voices. We get it out of the house. Boys can get hit and then we can blow. Yeah, we get a grand place and stop in. <laughs> He's just no ever made. Shut it. up, no man. Hey, what's that creaking noise? There are two men in the boathouse, Alfred. Oh, I see. What do we do now, Master Dick? Wait for them to give up looking for us and then go to the police. Nobody here. Must have been no Alfred and I stayed in the tunnel all the rest of the night, Superman, and all the next day. The men didn't leave, eh? No. Him. Just a minute. When you opened the trap door in the boathouse, one of the men there said they were being paid by... What was the name? It was an odd name. It sounded like Zoltan. Zoltan, eh? Okay, go on, Robin. Well, like I said, we stayed in the tunnel all that night and all the next day. We could hear them looking for us, tramping across the floor. Finally, they stopped looking, but they didn't go away. I kept hoping Batman would show up, but he didn't. And then I knew something had happened to him, and I had to try to find him. So when evening came again, that was this evening, I inched the trap door open in the boathouse. I see. Are they still there, Master Dick? Just one of them. He's sitting with his back to us, looking out at the water. I trust he's enjoying the view, what? Look, Alfred, I've got an idea. But you've got to help me, will you? Of course, Master Dick, you know that. Good. I've written a note. I want you to deliver it for me. Deliver a note? My word, I'll be happy to, but how do I get out of here? I'll take care of this fellow in the boathouse, and you... But the chap has a gun. Oh, I can handle him. Now, listen. When I tackle him, you run out the back door of the boathouse. It's dark, and chances are you can slip through the grounds without being seen. Then step on it to the Daily Planet newspaper as fast as you can. Right, oh, Master Dick. But I really think I should help you with that character in the boathouse. I'll take care of him. Get ready now. I'm going to open the trap door. I'm ready, sir. Ready and eager. So far, so good. I'll sneak up on him so he won't hear me. Now, when I call to you, Alfred, run and good luck. And the same to you, sir. Here I go. Well, for a while there, we had quite a tussle. But Batman taught me judo, you know, and I was able to knock the gunman out. Then I got into our rowboat and started pulling away. Well, uh, why did you use the rowboat? I wanted a safe place to meet you, and I thought out on the bay was the best place. Mm-hmm. But when I was about 200 yards offshore, I heard the man I'd knocked out come to and start yelling. A little later, I heard a speedboat start up. It had a powerful spotlight. And then... Yes, I can guess the rest of it. They uh, caught up with you and shot you. That explains your head wound. I imagine they thought they finished you. I guess so. I passed out and didn't wake up until I was in the doctor's house with Mr. Kent and Jimmy Olsen and Miss Lane. Well, you don't know it, but that speedboat hung around a while, saw Jim and Miss Lane pick you up, and then ran them down. (laughs) Nice fellows. Well, I've got work to do now, Robin. You're going to look for Batman? In a way, yes. Now, you listen to me. Clark Kent may be back here before, uh, well, before I return. If he does show up, trust him and go with him. You understand? Yes, but, but what can Mr. Kent do? Almost as much as I can. So long, Robin. Or maybe I'd get... Better get used to calling you Dick. Where are you going? Out this window. Why, no, but what about Batman? You let me worry about Batman from here on in. See you soon. Up! Up! And away! Leaping into the darkness, Superman swiftly disappears. Where is he going? We'll return in a moment for the climax of today's episode. But first, here's a question for you. 
Gang, how well have you been studying the aviation facts that are printed on the backs of all the pet model planes? Can you tell the armament of each plane, its speed and range, as well as how to spot it? Remember, on the back of each plane model, you get a description of it and a list of specifications, as well as pointers on how to spot it. And don't forget either that there are 14 different models you can get in the Kellogg's Pet Packages. Four British, two Russian, and eight American. Now, they're made of colored cardboard, and they're really easy to put together. All you have to do is to press out the parts with your thumbs and assemble them. And best of all, gang, you don't have to send in a single penny to get any of these grand models. Not even a box stop. There's a plane right inside every single package of that super delicious cereal, Kellogg's Pep. So, gang, be sure your mother gets you a package of those golden, delicious whole wheat flakes tomorrow. See which model plane you find inside. And remember the name, Pep, P-E-P. Pep is made by Kellogg's in Battle Creek. And now, back to the adventures of Superman. Leaving Dick Grayson, alias Robin, in his apartment, Superman disappeared, only to return an hour later in his guise of Clark Kent with Dick's dry clothes. Then, taking a taxi... Kent and Dick rode across town to a dark street facing a deserted park, where we join them now. What are we doing here, Mr. Kent? Well, I'm not quite sure myself, Dick. Well, then why... Take it easy. You see that one-story building we're coming to with the two wide barred windows across the front? Uh-huh. It looks like a fancy store. Hmm. Only there's no way to get in. The doors are on the side. What sort of a place is it? Well, there are gilt letters on the brick just above the windows. You see them? Oh, Yeah. Zoltan's Wax Museum. Zoltan! Keep your voice down. That's the name the man in the boathouse used. Uh-huh. Or I think it was. Yes, you see, that's just the trouble. You're not sure. But it's the only lead we've got so far. And this Zoltan, who owns the Wax Museum, is the only one with that name in the phone book and the city directory. But what could a man in a wax museum have to do with Batman disappearing? We don't know if he did have anything to do with it. But as I say, it's our only lead so far, so come on. Where? I don't want to have a look through those windows. But it's too dark to see anything. You know, I can see pretty well in the dark. The street lamp behind us throws a little light. All right, hold up now. Hmm. Just a lot of life-size wax figures standing around the floor. Yeah, I can see them. They're all dressed up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they look kind of weird in the dark, don't they? No. Yeah. Funny. What, Mr. Kent? Those wax figures. There's something familiar about the faces, but I... I can't quite place them. I can't either. They... Oh, gosh, look. What, Dick? Over to the left. Against the wall. What? It's Batman. Batman? Yeah, look. It's Batman. Yes, I see. Only... Only he's a wax statue. Startled, Clark Kent's eyes followed Dick Grayson's trembling finger to the silent, life-sized figure of the missing Batman. What can this mean? Fellows and girls, there's a startling surprise in store for you and for Superman on Monday. So don't miss it. Tune in, same time, same station, for another exciting episode in The Adventures of Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Fellows and girls, be sure to follow the adventures of Superman. Brought to you every day, Monday through Friday, same time, same station, by the makers of that super delicious cereal, Kellogg's Pep. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC Publications. This is Mutual. The super delicious cereal presents... The Adventures of Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's 
Superman! Yes, it's Superman, strange visitor from another planet who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, defender of law and order, champion of equal rights, valiant, courageous fighter against the forces of hate and prejudice. Today, we conclude our story of the strange bank robberies. So stand by for the dramatic climax with Superman, Batman, and Robin and the beginning of a brand new story. But now, let's see what's going on over at Dan McCullough's house this afternoon. Hi, Sally. Come on in the living room. Oh, Dan, it's the best Valentine I ever got. Yeah? Which one? The one you sent, of course, with a comic button on it. Oh, yeah. That's from a package of Kellogg's Pep we opened the other day. Oh, I'm so thrilled. Hey, Dan. Hi, Rusty. Come on in. Hey, Dan, that's a swell idea. A valentine with a comic button for my collection. I got one, too, Rusty. Yeah? Which one? Moon Mullins. I got the Superman button. Oh. You got Moon Mullins? Yes. Swap the Superman for Moon Mullins. <laughs> yeah, that's the idea. Cinch that trade right away. You don't mind, do you, Dan? Why, of course not. All the gang knows that's a swell way to get a new and different comic button for your collection. And all the gang's mighty busy these days working toward all 18 buttons in the series. Of course, it's a real help that these comic buttons are so easy to get. You don't have to send in a single penny, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. All you do is to ask Mom to get you some of that super delicious whole wheat flake cereal, Kellogg's Pep. Inside every package, there's an exclusive prize for you. Remember, that's P-E-P, -E -P, Pep, made by Kellogg's of Battle Creek. No, the adventures of Superman. Learning that a mysterious bank robber who has been impersonating him and apparently possesses superhuman strength planned a $50 million burglary, Superman and his friends, Batman and Robin, found a clue in a back issue of the Daily Planet. The Metropolis Banknote Company, which prints paper money for the Treasury, had that day completed the printing of $50 million and had stored it in the company's underground vaults. Carrying Batman and Robin, Superman hovered in the dark sky above the ancient tomb-like building. And shortly after one o'clock in the morning, his X-ray vision spotted the mysterious bank robber and six men in an old sewer tunnel directly beneath the vaults. As we continue now, having obtained entrance to the building, our three friends are in the basement vaults. Listen. What are they doing now, Superman? Removing the loose concrete. What loose concrete? Under a section of this floor. They must have been working on it a long time. The concrete is at least eight inches thick. Jeepers. Okay, get ready. They'll be coming through any second now. All right. Well, Superman is finishing the job with a padded sledgehammer. Hey, he is pretty strong. He's plenty strong. Robin and I tangled with him and got bounced around like rubber dolls. We know. Yeah, and don't forget how he ripped open the steel bank doors. Hold it. It's broken through. Now listen, let me handle this. Are you kidding? You said he had six huskies with him. I know, but watch I still... Watch it. Here comes the first guy through the hole. Wait, wait, hide the vaults. Okay, now don't show yourselves until I give the word. Are the others coming up? Yes. We'll wait until they're all above decks and we'll move. Quiet now. There are six of them and the phony super ant, huh? Yes. We're outnumbered just enough to make it interesting. Okay. Let's jump them before they can get to their guns. Leave the man in the costume and cape to me. All right. Let's go, Robin. Right with you, Pappy. Good evening, gentlemen. Hey, look, three guys. Well, thank you, you here. Oh, here's my calling card. Rita, uh, when yeah. you wake up. Uh, get out of here. You're the one I want to meet. Uh, All right, my pony friend. Let's see if you do have superhuman strength. Uh, nice going, Robin. Uh, Stay away from those guns, mister. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. won't. Love you. Okay. Yeah. With your eyes. Oh, 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 and a boy, Batman. Oh, your uh, eyes are uh, popping out, uh, Stranger. Uh, do you mind if I uh, pop uh, back in for you? Hey, I'm running out of sparring partners, Batman. There's just this one left. I'll take him. Pardon me, friend. Your chin show. Well, there were six little gunmen, but now there are none. Now we can help Superman. Oh, he doesn't need any help. Look behind you. Christopher Columbus. He's swinging the phony around like a Ferris wheel. I get busy. What Oh, by all means, we've got some talking to do. Down on your feet. There we are. Feel strong like lions. Superman's got him tamed, Robin. Tame as a kitten. Now, what's your name? I, Boris. Boris what? Boris Mikhailovich Petrovsky. Oh, brother, what a mouthful. Quiet, Robin. I, not bad man. 
I do nothing wrong. Oh, no? How about robbing all those banks? I no keep money. I give to, to, how you say, char char charity. Charity, sure, to make the police think I was the thief. But the $50 million in these vaults weren't going to charity. This was the big deal you were building up to. You intended to keep this money and brand me as the burglar. Oh, I no keep any money. Mr. Simpson, he say, all this I do is, uh, uh, how you say, uh, probably, uh, probably is, uh, it get Boris very big name. Why did you want to get publicity? Boris go on stage, make money. The stage? The other. Uh, people pay much money see Boris. Strongest man in the whole world. Uh, Mr. Simpson, you say, Boris make lots money. Who's Mr. Simpson? Uh, that he there he lie on the floor. Fancy vest and spats? No, no. He give a ticket, come America. He say, make Boris rich man. He say, Boris do like he say, get much of uh, publicity. Nuts. I think he's telling the truth, Robin. I don't. Nobody can be that dumb. Da, da. Mr. Simpson say, Boris very dumb. That mean Boris very strong, no? You say you believe him, Superman? Yes, I think he was taken advantage of by this Simpson. Played for a sucker, you mean? That's right. Of course, we'll check on his story. Tell me, Boris, how did you open those bank doors and vaults? And how did you bend those steel bars into pretzels? Hey, Mr. Simpson, give Boris this. What's that? Looks like an aluminum cylinder. It's just what it is. There are three electronic tubes inside it and a battery strapped around his chest. Boris hold this to door, still get soft. Get soft? But the uh, start melt, then Boris take hold and pull the rest away. Not hard for so strong men like me. Ray Jupiter, you mean this thing melts steel? I don't believe it. I do. I've heard of diathermic rays used to soften steel. Remember I showed you how the bank door in Lordville was wrenched out of shape, Batman? Yeah, hey, that's right. But it was done with this electronic gadget. Well, I'll be jiggered. Oh, here comes the police. Anderson's eyes are going to pop when he sees these goons stretched out on the floor. Uh -huh. You think they got a jail strong enough to hold this guy? Oh, no. Yes, I no go to jail. I know the bad. Well, that'll be up to a judge to decide, Boris. That's how we do things here in America. Hey, but I, Boris, I good man. I not do nothing. Yes, sir. Order in the court. Boris Petrovsky. Step up, Boris. The... Since it is evident that you're only an innocent dupe in the hands of George Simpson, alias George Tanner, with a long police record, this court is patrolling you in the custody of Clark Kent. Court adjourned. You're free, Boris. The judge isn't sending you to jail. Oh, I kiss the hand of the judge. Never mind that. Come along. I'm going to get you a job operating one of the Daily Planet presses where you can put some of that strength of yours to good use. Oh, I am so happy. So glad. I With tears of happiness rolling down his cheeks, Boris, the big Russian, leaves the courtroom in the custody of his newfound friend, the man he had innocently tried to wrong. And so Superman has solved another baffling mystery. But if he thinks he can lean back and relax, he is sadly mistaken. For at this very moment, another adventure is brewing. This one more amazing than any that have gone before. We'll return in a moment to begin a new Superman adventure. But first, here is your announcer. You know, gang, it'd be a doggone shame if you should miss out on a single one of those swell comic buttons Kellogg's Pep is putting out. Because every single one of these 18 different buttons is so bright colored and gleaming. Why, they look uh, mighty smart pinned on your jacket or your dresser cap. And every single picture of your favorite comic strip characters is a dead ringer for one of the friends you've been following in the funny papers for a long time. And here's something else that you wouldn't want to miss. The exciting fun of getting a new button every time Mom opens a new package of pet. And even more fun trading duplicates with your pals. So hop to it, gang. Ask Mom to get you some more of that super delicious whole wheat flake cereal, Kellogg's Pep. That's the only way you can get these comic buttons. You don't send in a single penny, not even a box stop, and you can't buy them anywhere. But there's an exclusive prize for you in every package of P-E-P, -E -P, Pep, made by Kellogg's, the greatest name in cereals. Now, back to the adventures of Superman. Our scene is the city room of the Daily Planet. In 
in Lois Lane's absence, young Jimmy Olsen has been using her office. And as we look in now, the telephone on the desk has just rung. Swinging back in his chair, Jimmy lifts the receiver. Well, Olsen speaking. James, is it you I'm speaking to? What? Who is this, Poco? Is there anyone else in space or time who thinks in rhythm and talks in rhyme? <laughs> oh, it's Poco, all right. How are you, pal? Oh, I'm fine, friend James. And how are you? Do you still have plenty of work to do? No, I'm just moping around waiting for something to happen. A trip where? To the moon. In a balloon. Are you kidding? Oh, honest ancient and cross my heart. Just say the word and we can start. Uh, Professor Twiddle is standing by to shoot his rocket into the sky. Now, wait a minute, Poco. What kind of double talk are you handing me? You mean to say someone's going to try to fly to the moon in a rocket? Oh, Professor Twiddle, who happens to be an expert in astronomy, is quite convinced that it is no dream to fly to the moon on a radar beam. And so he's built a rocket ship controlled by radar to make the trip from the Earth to the moon in nothing flat. Now tell me, what do you think of that? Oh, I think it's crazy. Oh, crazy yes or crazy no. Professor Twiddle is ready to go. Maybe he's right and maybe he's wrong. But he'd like us both to go along. Me fly to the moon in a rocket? Oh, no. Oh, don't say no till you hear the story at Professor Twiddle's laboratory. Can you meet me there at half past two so he himself can tell it to you? Well, where is it? Oh, 607 Winthrop Street, where the avenue and the parkway meet. But don't breathe a word to a single soul, or you'll get me in a terrible hole. Oh, okay. Oh, toodaloo till half past two. Toodaloo. Hanging up, Jimmy shakes his head and rubs his eyes as though he had just awakened from a dream. Is Poco serious? Or is it just a gag? Well, just between us, it's far from a gag. And if you listen tomorrow, you'll meet the eccentric Professor Twiddle and learn how Jimmy and Poco get themselves involved in an adventure in space that almost defies the best efforts of Superman to save them. So don't miss tomorrow's episode. It's the beginning of a new and excitingly different story. Tune in, same time, same station, and follow the adventures of Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Fellows and girls, be sure to follow the adventures of Superman. Brought to you every day, Monday through Friday, same time, same station, by the grand old Kellogg Company of Battle Creek. Superman is also the copyrighted feature, appearing in Superman DC Publications. Say, gang, you'll get a bang out of this. Kellogg's Variety is back. That's the grand 10-package assortment of six swell Kellogg cereals. Makes breakfast more fun than a picnic. Makes it easy for mom, too. No dishes to wash, thanks to the new Kell Bowl Pack. You can eat right out of it. What's more, these generous packages are great for lunchboxes and outings. So ask mom to hurry and get Kellogg's Variety at her grocer's the very first chance. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. I played Clark Kent just a little bit higher to leave myself somewhere to go with the up, up, and away. The idea that there is someone somewhere that you could be like if you were impervious to bullets, if you were able to leap tall buildings at a single bound, if you're able to do all of those things, and I think every small boy especially, at some time in his growing up, goes to bed at night imagining all the things that he would have done if, or that he would do if. Uh, this is the, the great thing of imagination. Sometimes today they call it wool gathering. I never did. I think it's uh, there's, there's too little of that. There should be more. The adventures of Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. First thing that I ever did was uh, 1932. Uh, the work that I was doing then, singing and acting on radio, to pay my way through law school. Graduated from law school in 1933. We did a quick read-through sitting around a table, 
And then we did a dress rehearsal, and then we went on the air. About an hour and a half overall for cuts and write-ins and changes and so forth. Uh, the, the things that should be uh, keepsakes today and that would really be mementos of a forgotten past were the uh, dress rehearsals every day on that show. It was something about the way outness of the characters we portrayed and the, and the situations we found ourselves in that we used to camp and horse that dress rehearsal as far out as you could climb a piece of scenery. On the air, it all, but if we hadn't done that on the dress to get the laughs out of our system, it could well have broken you up. It was so far out. But on the air, it all sounded real legitimate, and playing it that far out and, and seriously was the right thing to do. What, what, what's uh, uh, fantasy is, is delightful. What's done without uh, uh, begging your pardon, uh, Monsieur et Madame. You know, so many people get at least a bit embarrassed by fantasy when they're directing it or performing it, and it loses all the great charm it could have. But if played honestly and whole hog all the way, it's great. And that almost is what this was. It was kind of a fantasy, and we get this out of our system on the dress rehearsal, and, oh, I can remember uh, Ed Bagley walking out around the place after he said, I can't go through this. I can't go through this again. You're absolutely out of your mind. Comes the air, you give a fine performance. I don't understand it. I don't know how you could live with it. Especially in the medium of, of radio, where you, you, you couldn't be seen. You had it have been entirely on voice. Uh, you laughed. You got, I mean, it, it threw you to a certain extent, but everybody always pulled together so that, believe me, it was a live show and it's something that had to go through. And everybody rallied instinctively. And somehow the show got on with maybe the audience saying, what was that, you know? But that's about all. I also admit that I enjoy having people recognize me now, and I will definitely miss it when it stops. There was something, really, about uh, being able to go anywhere you wanted to, and only your voice was your giveaway. Sometimes if you were uh, in a store, a saleswoman or a salesman might recognize your voice and say, aren't you in radio? But if you watched that and didn't give it, you know, too much of your own self, why, you could go anywhere you wanted, dressed as you please, too. I tell you, it was a funny thing, though, on that show, because when we all came to audition for this new idea, this Superman thing, we knew about the comic strip and everything. They didn't know whether they wanted one man for each part, Clark Kent and Superman, or whether they wanted two. Didn't know how it should be played or anything. And when I heard that what I was auditioning for, I fought with Bob Maxwell, who owned the rights of the thing. I said, uh, this is not for me. You know, that embarrassed me. I said, no. He said, well, just audition, and you, we'll use you all in some parts when, if it goes on the air. Well, it did go on the air, and uh, came in, and he said, you're Superman. And I, again, took the scripts, handed them to him, and tried to walk out and, and get out of the show. I really fought to unload it right then and there. The whole thing embarrassed me so. Then, of course, it grew into a magnificent, really, career within career. It was great fun. It was a great way to get all your inhibitions out real fast. I walked with my precious Pat, who's now married. They're all married. And uh, when she was three years old, I was taking a walk with her out in Manhasset, where we lived at the time, and a little boy about four came up and walked along, looking up at me with great admiration. All of a sudden, he said to Pat, gee, your daddy's Superman, isn't he? Who, Bud? No, he's just an actor. He was so for granted, you know. What's, what's the big hoop do? I mean, so? That's the way they always took it, I think. And that's the way they do today. But there were something like... Uh, 10, 12, 15 soaps that went on within two or three floors at NBC and CBS. And you went there and you stayed, you met everybody. You saw 75 people. You got to be very close friends and swapped stories with them and had a lot of laughs. It was really great. Television, this is not true. It takes longer to rehearse. They're farther apart. When they're there, they're there to work because time is fairly limited and they've got to learn their parts. Now it's not all from a script. And it's just different. It doesn't have the camaraderie, and it's too bad. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. <laughs> Superman accepts the challenge of his very existence as he steps upon an open platform to face the cruel, relentless possessor of his one enemy, deadly, destructive Kryptonite. And now, the adventures of Superman. 
last remaining piece of kryptonite, the strange green glowing metallic substance that is Superman's only unconquerable enemy, is in the hands of big George Latimer, the crooked ex-political boss whom Superman once sent to prison. Aware that Superman cannot come within ten feet of the kryptonite without losing all his strength, Latimer has challenged the Man of Steel to appear before an audience with him and deny the charges that he, Superman, framed the evidence that put Latimer behind bars. In yesterday's episode, as you remember, after Latimer's challenge appeared in the Daily Planet opposition paper, the Metropolis Star, Superman decided on a desperate move. Hovering over Latimer's big stone house, he determined by means of his X-ray vision that the crooked politician was asleep in a front bedroom. Cautiously, then, he raised one of the windows and was about to enter the room when suddenly Latimer awakened, snapped on a light, and seeing Superman framed in the open window, swept his hand across the night table near his bed. A small lead box fell to the floor. The cover snapped open and out rolled the jagged piece of kryptonite, glowing green against the dark rug. As we continue now, Superman, unable to check his leap into the room, has come within ten feet of the kryptonite. Down on his knees, he is fighting desperately against its deadly effect. Quickly, Latimer gets out of bed, slips into a robe, and moves the piece of kryptonite closer to the fast-weakening man of steel. His eyes are bright, and his thick lips curl back from his teeth in a leering smile. Don't waste your time struggling, Superman. You know you can't lick it. Got you just where I want you. It won't do you any good. Oh, no? No. I wonder how it feels to slap your face. Let's see. <coughs> Anyone ever did that to you in all your high-flying experience? You'll be sorry you did it. <laughs> You'll make me laugh. Waiting almost a year for this day. I dreamed about it at night when they locked me into my cell. The cell you sent me to. Now here it is. Superman down on the floor. Weak as a newborn puppy. Where did you get the kryptonite? I'm an old friend of yours. Ever hear of the laugh? The laugh? You've heard it all right. Died in the prison hospital. He left me a legacy. A piece of kryptonite. It's going to make me more powerful in this state than I was before you interfered. And only that, it's going to put you under my thumb. You won't be able to rave and rant about racial and religious discrimination. No Jew or Catholic or black man will hold a state job if I have anything to do with it. I'll clean them all out. Did anyone ever tell you that a, a rattlesnake has more decency than you have, Latimer? Shut up. Shut up, Earl. One thing you can't do, Latimer, is hurt me. I haven't any strength, but you can't hurt me. I'll hurt you when I'm ready to. Don't worry about that. For the time being, I want to use you. Prove to the people of the state that I was framed by you. That... Won't be so easy. Like rolling off a log. Tomorrow night, I'm addressing a mass meeting at the auditorium. I challenged you to appear on the same platform with me and deny my charges. You won't appear. You don't dare appear. Because I'll have the kryptonite with me, and you certainly wouldn't want to collapse in front of 2,000 people. So what happened? You failed to show up to answer my charges. That means I'm telling the truth. I was willing to face you. But you're not willing to. Me? You're, you're crazy if you think the public will fall for that. I've been a politician long enough to know the public falls for anything you sell them. I'm going to sell them into believing that you're a blackmailer and a thief. What are you... What are you planning to do with me? This will surprise you, no doubt. I'm going to let you go. Yes. Right now, you're more valuable to me, alive and free. I'll move the kryptonite back so you can regain your strength. Then you can leave the way you came. Out the window. Hey, how's that? Careful now. Don't try any tricks. Standing right over the kryptonite. You know what'll happen if you come near me. Now get up on your feet. Don't be a fool, Latimer. You know what happens to people who misuse power? It won't happen to me. That's what your friend Hitler said, and Mussolini, and Goering, and Himmler. I'm not interested in what anyone said. Get out now before I change my mind and bring you down to your knees again. All right, but I'm warning you. You can't win playing the game the way you're trying to play it. As long as I've got you where I want you. Nothing else worries me. The trick, Latimer, is to keep me where you want me. Out and away! Leaping out into the darkness, Superman hesitates for a moment in hovering flight. And then, red cape streaming in the night wind, heads for the suburban home of Perry White, editor of the Daily Planet. Minutes later, he faces the gray-haired editor. 
sorry to have to disturb you at this hour, Mr. White, but I'm glad you did. Now maybe we can get some things cleared up. Now, this business with Big George Latimer is serious. Not only are you on the spot, but the planet is, too. We back you when you broke up Latimer's hold on the state capitol and sent him to prison, you know. You're not sorry, are you? Of course not. The charges he's made have to be answered, which I assume you'll do. That's exactly why I'm here, to give you a statement. A statement isn't enough, Superman. What? Latimer challenged you to appear at the Metropolis Auditorium tomorrow night and deny his charges. And that's what you'll have to do. Why? Why is that necessary? Latimer accuses you of framing evidence against him and attempting to blackmail him. Well, aren't accusations of that kind important enough for you to deny in person? Yes, of course, but... Uh, but what? Now, there are some things, Mr. White, that are difficult to explain. Not if they're on the level. You don't think for a moment that, that Latimer's telling the truth? All I know is that if you don't appear, a lot of people are going to think so. Well, I know this sounds peculiar, but in this case, no one would believe the truth. You've got to stand behind me, Mr. White. You've got to trust me. I'm going to do everything in my power to work this out. But until then, please don't let me down. As Superman makes an impassioned plea for support, Perry White regards him strangely, unable to understand why the Man of Steel cannot deny Big George Latimer's charges in person. In that moment, a tiny seed of suspicion plants itself in the editor's mind. The horrible suspicion that Latimer's accusations may be true. We'll return in a moment to learn what happens in this tense situation. So keep listening. And now back to the adventures of Superman. It is the following evening. The Metropolis Auditorium is packed to the rafters with people who have come to witness, they hope, the personal appearance of Superman to deny Big George Latimer's slanderous charges. Perry White, Lois Lane, and Clark Kent are in the audience as Latimer walks out on the stage to be greeted by a mixture of applause and boos. Hear the booing, Chief? Uh, there isn't enough of it, Lois. Some of them are applauding. Hey, what's the matter with you, Kent? Huh? Why don't you go home and go to sleep if you're tired, Clark? Uh, I'm not tired. I'm, I'm just thinking. Thinking about what? Well, Quiet, Lois. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here tonight. down to the empty lounge where he quickly strips off the clothes of the mild-mannered reporter and stands revealed in the blue and red costume of Superman. I can't let him get away with this. I've got to call his bluff. He doesn't seem to have the kryptonite with him. Either he forgot it or thought it was too dangerous to carry. Anyway, it isn't on the platform and it isn't in any of his pockets. Well... Here goes. For better or worse. Mounting the steps leading to the auditorium, Superman prepares to accept Big George Latimer's false challenge. Fairly certain that Latimer does not have the deadly piece of kryptonite with him. But Superman is wrong. This time Latimer has been too smart for him. There is a piece of kryptonite on the politician's person. In fact, it is in clear view, but Superman has failed to see it. The question now is... Will he see it before he steps up on the platform? Fellows and girls, Monday's episode is super tense and super exciting as the Man of Steel runs the risk of collapsing in front of thousands of people. 
Don't miss it, whatever you do. Be sure to tune in Monday. Same time, same station. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Today, Superman is confronted with the possible climax of his life and career as a gaping, spellbound audience watches even stride leading to the very spot of the deadly kryptonite. And now, the adventures of Superman. For some mysterious chemical reason, a jagged piece of green glowing kryptonite, a fragment torn from the planet Krypton when it exploded in space, is Superman's only unconquerable enemy. When he ventures within 10 feet of the kryptonite, the Man of Steel not only loses his superhuman powers, but becomes as weak and helpless as a babe in arms. And now, the only existing piece of kryptonite is in the hands of big George Latimer, the crooked political boss Superman was instrumental in sending to jail. In our last episode, as you remember, Latimer called a huge mass meeting at the Metropolis Auditorium in order to publicly accuse Superman of having framed evidence against him and attempted to blackmail him. As Latimer, speaking from the auditorium platform before a packed house, said, I challenge Superman to step up here and deny these charges. I challenge him to face me before all of you people of Metropolis and deny that he not only framed evidence against me, evidence that resulted in my being sent to prison, but that he also demanded that I pay him $100,000 in blackmail money. Let him come up on this platform and deny it. In the audience, Lois Lane and Editor Perry White are puzzled as Clark Kent, who as we know as Superman, suddenly gets up and leaves. Clark is going to miss the big show. What big show? Superman giving Latimer the business. Well, uh, if that's what you're expecting, Lois, you're not uh, going to be disappointed. Oh, now, Chief, at your age, Superman can't afford to have charges like that made in public without denying them. I'm you. only telling you what I think. Don't worry, he'll be here, and then you'll see some fireworks. Meanwhile, in the deserted lounge at the rear of the auditorium, down a flight of steps, Clark Kent has stripped off the business suit disguise of the mild-mannered, bespectacled newspaper reporter and stands revealed in the blue and red of Superman. I can't let him get away with calling me a blackmailer in front of 2,000 people. He doesn't seem to have that piece of kryptonite anywhere on him or around him, so I guess I can take a chance. Listen to them applauding him. Every word out of his mouth is a lie, but evidently they're ready to believe him. All right, Latimer, you asked for it. Now you're going to get it. Starting up the steps to the main floor of the auditorium where Big George Latimer is still hurling challenge after challenge at him, Superman is determined once and for all to put a stop to Latimer's attempt to regain his political position by making false accusations, despite the fact that it may mean exposing himself to the strength-robbing effect of the last remaining piece of kryptonite. Meanwhile, in the audience... Two friends of Superman's, the famous Batman and Robin, attired now in their ordinary street clothes, are listening to Latimer weave his fabric of falsehoods. I feel Leaning I have over a duty and an obligation to the people of this state. If Superman Why doesn't show up soon and shove that windbag's words down his throat, I'm going to... Relax, Robin. The chances are he won't show up. Why not? There is some Sunday reason. Quiet now. I'm not hearing. I expose him as a charlatan and a blackmailer. Further than that, if he dares to appear on this platform, I will prove to each and every one of you that he is not a Superman. Did you, did you hear what I heard, Batman? Yes, and he'll do it, too. You mean to hold it. I will prove beyond the shadow of a doubt 
that Superman has lost his amazing power. You will see before your very eyes the spectacle of his weakness. In fact, I will show you how I, George Latimer, can bring the great Superman to his knees. Is he crazy? I'm afraid not. For the first time tonight, he's telling the truth. You mean Superman has lost his strength? Well, not quite. I don't get it. First you say... platform for the stage entrance. Hide somewhere in the wing, and don't let Latimer see you if you can help him. What's on the fire? There may be trouble. You stand by on the platform. Right. Where are you be? I'll stick close to Superman if I catch him going down the aisle. Do you think we can squeeze out of here? Yeah, with a little pushing and shoving. Excuse me, please. Oh, Getting out. Now. Inching their way along the row of occupied seats, Batman and Robin finally reached the crowded aisle. Robin, following instructions, heads for the stage door entrance to the platform, while Batman, excusing himself, forces his way up the aisle to meet the Man of Steel who has just broken away from the screaming, milling mob. Recognizing his friend, Superman addresses him by his real name. Bruce, what are you doing here? You wouldn't miss this show for a million. You've certainly got them carrying the rafters down. It'll take an hour to get through at this rate unless I fly over their heads. I'm not so sure that platform's a healthy place for you. Why? I don't like the self-satisfied smile on Latimer's face. Well, the kryptonite is not on the platform. Are you sure? If I can trust my eyes. Can't we do anything to clear this aisle? Ask them all to be seated. They may listen to you. All right. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. Please. 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 Someone will get hurt if they don't clear the aisle. Ladies and gentlemen, you must clear the center aisle and return to your seats before someone gets hurt. You'll be able to see and hear everything from your seats. Please return to them. Oh, that did it. They'll settle down now. Watch it. Hey, come Lois Lane and Perry White. Be careful what you say. Sure thing. I'm certainly glad you showed up, Superman. I was worried for a while. I'm glad to know someone worries about me, Miss Lane. Hello, Mr. White. Uh, Seems your mind about coming down, I say. Well, uh, yes. Uh, most of you know Bruce Wayne, don't you? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't recognize you, nice Mr. Wayne. Nice to see you again. Oh, here we go again. Please. I see that Superman has decided to accept my challenge and attempt to deny the public charges I have made. If he's got nothing else, he's got nothing. A great many people, I am sure, expect me to withdraw those charges now that Superman has appeared. I do not withdraw them. If anything, I wish to make them stronger. And I wish to repeat the statement I made a few moments ago. The statement that Superman no longer possesses superhuman power. Why, he's out of his mind. And he has lost all his strength. And that I... George Latimer will bring to his knees on this platform before your very eyes. Looks like it's your move, Superman. Go up there and show him to take a toe. Yes. Yes, I will. Will you step up to the platform, Superman? Are you sure the stuff's nowhere around? I'm checking again. He hasn't got it on him. There's nothing on the platform except a table, two chairs, and a couple of microphones. You better go up there, Superman. The crowd is getting impatient. Oh, yes, yes. I'm going. Well, this is it. Riding down the aisle with his red cape streaming behind him, Superman heads for the auditorium platform. His broad shoulders squared and his lips set in a tight, determined line. On the platform, standing behind the two microphones attached to the public address system, big George Latimer waits with a knowing smile. Is Superman walking into a trap? If Latimer has the deadly kryptonite, where is it? We'll learn in just a moment when we return for the tense and exciting climax of this episode. So keep listening. Now back to the adventures of Superman. Before an audience of more than 2,000 tense and eager citizens of Metropolis... Superman has accepted the challenge of the ex-political boss, Big George Latimer, to appear on the platform of the Metropolis Auditorium and deny charges hurled at him by the man he once sent to prison. The danger to Superman, of course, lies in the fact that Latimer has the only remaining piece of kryptonite, the strange metallic substance that robbed the Man of Steel of all his strength. However, after scanning everything on the platform with his X-ray vision and seeing no evidence of the kryptonite, Superman decided to take a chance. We find him now approaching the platform steps as Lois Lane, Perry White, and Bruce Wayne, also known as Batman, stand in the center aisle watching him. 
There is not a sound in the huge auditorium. The audience to a man is on its feet. Suddenly, Lois's whispered voice breaks the silence. It's not a funny feeling. Something is wrong. Oh, I have a funny feeling. This time, she's not far wrong, Mr. White. You mean something is going to happen? I hope not. Now, look, what's this all about? If you know anything, I know plenty, but I can't tell you now. There he goes up the steps. Keep your eye on him. The next 30 seconds will tell the story. Mounting the platform steps, Superman looks back at Lois White and Batman and forces a smile. And in the moment that his sharp eyes are turned away from Latimer, the politician reaches out and flips a lever on one of the microphone stands. Immediately, a tiny panel slides back on one side of the microphone, exposing the jagged piece of green glowing kryptonite hidden in it. As Latimer tricks Superman by hiding the kryptonite in a false microphone, a microphone made of lead through which Superman's X-ray vision could not penetrate, this is the big moment, fellows and girls. So be sure to hear tomorrow's exciting episode to learn whether Superman does lose his strength and power before an audience of 2,000 people. Be sure to tune in tomorrow. Same time, same station. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time.